Welcome to the lecture series in food microbiology. In the last session, we were discussing about classification of food borne diseases. We are going to continue that talking about how the different microbes can cause the manifestation of the disease or how their toxins can cause disorders to humans. If you see worldwide, which are the types of food which are implicated with food borne diseases, you see that almost all categories of food, basically the most of the proportion would be the meat and the meat products, the poultry, the egg and egg products, seafoods, these carry the bulk of the causative organisms which cause food borne disorders. Then comes the milk and the dairy products, the fruit, vegetable, cereals, the plant products. Finally comes your confectionery, mixer dishes and multiple foods which form a lesser part. But both plant based foods as well as animal based foods do contain specific microorganisms which can cause food borne diseases. The first among them which we are going to talk about is Staphylococcus intoxication. Staph food intoxication or food poisoning is characterized by a sudden start of nausea, vomiting and stomach cramps and most of the people who get the disease also have diarrhea and the symptoms usually develop within 30 minutes to 8 hours which means that the incubation time is pretty long after eating or drinking an item containing staphylococcus toxin. So, here it is not the live staphylococcus which is causing the disorder, but the toxin which has been secreted by staph and which is present in the contaminated food or water that causes the disorder and normally not longer than a day and the severity of the severe illness is rare. Staphylococcus aureus is capable of making seven different toxins and it is often the cause of food poisoning. It is most commonly transferred to food products like milk and cheese through contact with food workers that carry Staphylococcus aureus. Now, the, if you look into the peculiarities of staph, it has a high salt tolerance and it can grow in ham and other meats and in dairy products. The toxins produced by staph are also heat resistant and they cannot be destroyed by cooking. And once the food has been contaminated by live organism, it will start multiplication, it will cause replicating in the food. And mostly the food products commonly associated with staphylococcal food poisoning are milk and cheeses. Now, those food which require a lot of handling and which are stored at room temperature, they are the ones which are commonly the causative reason for SPF. And these include the cold salads such as tuna, chicken, macaroni or ham salad, sliced meats, cream filled pastries etc. And to prevent the food poisoning and the spread of bacteria, the following precautions have to be taken. One, avoid consumption of unpasteurized milk. Two, wash hands and fingernails thoroughly before cooking, eating or serving food. Three, Maintain clean and sanitary surfaces for food preparation. 4. Store hot foods at temperature over 140 degree Fahrenheit and cold foods under 40 degree Fahrenheit. So, even after processing, if the food is not stored at the appropriate temperature, staph contamination can still happen. If you have wounds or sores on your hands or wrists, do not prepare food for others. Staphylococcus is a normal pathogen or a normal organism which dwells, which is seen everywhere and it also causes pimples, acne on many people. So, if such sores are present on your hands or on your face and you happen to use say rub on the pimple, break open the acne, then you will have the organism on your hand and without washing hands, if you still go and go prepare the food, the, this organism will get transferred to the food. Most of the strains of Staphylococcus can ferment mannitol and produce coagulase, thermonuclease and hemolysin, but different strains of Staphylococcus differ in their sensitivity to bacteriophages and the cells are killed at 66 degrees centigrade in 12 minutes 
and it is 72 degrees centigrade in 15 seconds. These are facultative anaerobes, but they can also grow under aerobic condition. They can ferment carbohydrate and also cause proteolysis by extracellular proteolytic enzymes. They are mesophiles with a growth temperature from ranging from 7 degrees to 48 degrees, which is quite wide range of temperature with normal rapid growth between 20 and 37. The enterotoxin producing Staphylococcus aureus strains have generally been associated with Staphylococcal food intoxication. So, you have enterotoxin producing strains versus strains which do not produce enterotoxin. It is those strains which can produce the enterotoxin which are uh, associated with the food bond disorder. Along with many other Staphylococci, Staphylococcus aureus are naturally present in the nose, throat, skin and hair, feathers in the case of poultry, of healthy humans, animals and birds. The enterotoxigenic strains of Staphylococcus aureus produces 7 different enterotoxins which are called as A, B, C1, C2, C3, D and E. It is called as Staphylococcus SEA standing for Staphylococcal Enterotoxin A. Staphylococcal enterotoxin B and so on and they are serologically distinct heat stable proteins of molecular weight 26 to 30 kilodalton and each differs from the other in their toxicity. So, A, B, C1, C2, C3, D and E are serologically distinct, they are heat stable, the molecular weight ranges from 26 kilodalton to 30 kilodalton and each one's toxicity is different and generally SEB is more heat stable than SEA and the normal cooking temperature and the cooking time, the process, the normal process which we use normally does not destroy the potency of the enterotoxin. Outbreaks from Staphylococcus enterotoxin A are more frequent probably because of its high potency. The rate of the toxin production by a strain is directly related to its rate of growth and cell concentration. That is, if I am saying the enterotoxin produced is A, that Staphylococcus aureus strain producing the enterotoxin A has to grow at a rapid phase in the food, which means the temperature has to be ideal and it should be conducive for asking the cell to have massive proliferation. Then the toxin will be produced and the optimum growth occurs between 37 and 40 degrees centigrade. The cephalococcal toxins are enteric toxins, they cause gastroenteritis and for a healthy adult to manifest the disorder, 30 grams or 30 ml of food containing 100 to 200 nanograms of the toxin has to be consumed and to produce this 100 to 200 nanograms of toxin, you require 10 to the power of 6 to 10 to the power of 7 cells in the contaminated food. If such a food is consumed, symptoms occur naturally within 2 to 4 hours with a range of 30 minutes to 8 hours and all this range time range is related to the potency of the enterotoxin as well as the amount of toxin ingested as well as the basic resistance immunity of the person. The primary symptoms uh, from the simulation of the autonomous nervous system by the toxins are salivation, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps and diarrhea. So, this enterotoxin is a protein. So, this goes and stimulates the autonomic nervous system. In turn, this stimulation of the autonomous nervous system will produce salivation, nauseal symptoms, induce vomiting, abdominal cramps and diarrhea. The secondary symptoms produced are sweating, chills, headache and dehydration. This is actually uh, the picture of a Staphylococcus aureus which is methicillin resistant. As you all know MRSA, the methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus is the most dangerous pathogen so far ever known because it is resistant to the highest grade antibiotic known methicillin. In general, the bacterium grows in the food and produces the toxins without adversely affecting the acceptance quality. So, even if the toxin is present in the food, it does not react with the food producing a disflavor or an unpleasant aroma or anything which is not acceptable to the consumer. So, you will not know that there is cephalococcus toxin present in the food. Many protein rich foods 
foods that are handled excessively, food in which associated bacteria grow poorly and foods that have been temperature abused are normally associated with staphylococcal gastroenteritis. And some of the foods that have been more frequently implicated are ham, corned beef, salami, bacon, barbecued meat, salads and bakery products containing cream, sauces and cheeses. These are the liable food which can cause staphylococcal intoxication. To associate a food implicated in staphylococcal food poisoning, the food and the vomit samples are analyzed for the presence of high levels of enterotoxigenic staphylococcus aureus cells and the enterotoxins. So, if you suspect that it is this food poisoning caused by staph, not only the food particle but also the vomit of the patient has to be examined and you have to find traces of either the live cells or high amounts of the staph enterotoxin. Both have to be confirmed not only in the food but suspected food but also in the vomit of the patient. And how do we enumerate it? Enumeration technique in one or more selective differential agar media to determine the load of viable cells of Staphylococcus aureus. So, as we saw earlier, you have specific new agar media which can promote the growth of specific microbe. So, here we look for you plate the cells, whatever live cells you take off from the food, you plate it on a suitable agar medium and look for the growth of the viable cells. Then you do a series of biochemical tests such as hemolysis, coagulase test, thermonuclease reactions or the ability of a pure culture to produce an enterotoxin. So, then you look for the biochemical test to confirm that it is staphylococcus. Then if you have isolated a cell, live cell, grow it into a pure culture and see whether it is producing the same enterotoxin which is present in the food or which was present in the vomit. Then it will confirm that this food poisoning or food borne intoxication was caused by this particular strain of Staphylococcus aureus. Prevention. When susceptible foods are produced with low numbers of Staphylococci, they remain free of enterotoxin and other food poisoning by hazards if kept either below 400 Fahrenheit or above 1400 Fahrenheit until consumed. Factors affecting for outbreak. 1. Inadequate refrigeration. 2. Preparing food far in advance of the planned service. So, you should have timeline of how early the food can be prepared and kept. Infected persons practicing pure personal hygiene, inadequate cooking or heat processing, holding the food in a warming device at bacterial growth temperatures. So, if you have cooked and kept the food in keep warm position, if the temperature in the keep warm position is conducive for bacterial growth, if the food has not been heat processed or it has been inadequately cooked, this will now promote the bacteria to grow and secrete more enterotoxin causing food poisoning. Enterotoxins from the food or the vomit samples are extracted and tested either by the biological means or by serological means to associate them with the outbreak. In serological methods, the enterotoxins are purified and examined by one of the several recommended immunological methods. Analysis of an outbreak. Let us see how from the point of view how we diagnose a food bond outbreak. Example, a food brown disease outbreak affecting 52 of 101 people who attended a dinner. The food were prepared at home, it was not bought from outside. It was reported December 6 on 1986. Out of the 52 people, 49 required immediate medical attention. And in all, the symptoms developed in less than 1 to 7 hours after the meal and this included 100 percent nausea that is out of the 52 people all exhibited nausea, 98 percent had vomiting, 90 percent had diarrhea, 83 percent had abdominal cramps, then frustration in 62 percent, chills in 52 percent, sweating in 35 percent and blood pressure temperature depression in 21 percent. So, within 1 to 7 hours all the 52 people showed a variety of symptoms which is normally associated with food poisoning. So, when the regulatory agency the people came to investigate after 36 hours, samples of the food or the vomit of the patients were not available from the doctors. So, each person after the meal 
after the dinner would have gone home, they got sick, they would have gone to their individual doctors. So, when the common meal source that is the dinner meat was traced back and the investigators came to the source where the dinner was held, there they neither was the food stamble stored nor could they get any sample of the vomit to be analyzed from the individual patient from the doctors. But one vomit sample was frozen where a patient was available and when analyzed it was found to have 12 to 19 into 10 to the power of 6 per gram of coagulase positive Staphylococcus aureus. So, one doctor had preserved a vomit sample which on diagnosis the investigators found Staphylococcus aureus which was coagulase positive and meat obtained from a leftover turkey carcass had 1 into 10 to the power of 6 gram of the same coagulase positive Staphylococcus aureus. The prepared food was not available, but the leftover turkey was available. So, when that was analyzed, that also contained coagulase positive Staphylococcus aureus at a range of 1 into 10 to the power of 6 per gram. And an investigation revealed that a person who had deboned and handled the tur cooked turkey had an erupting facial rash, which was an acne form. And remember, normally Staphylococcus aureus causes acne and three turkeys were improperly cooled following cooking and held on an improperly heated steam table for 4 hours before serving. Sorry, the person who handled the cooked turkey had the staph infection after while if it was properly cooked and if the holding temperature was high enough the toxin would have been destroyed. But both the precautions were not followed and it was held for an on an improperly heated steam table for 4 hours which means that long before the dinner had the food had been prepared and it was kept at an improper temperature which would have proliferated the organism and asked it to secrete more amount of enterotoxins. This is a classical case of the staphylococcal food poisoning outbreak in which more than half of the people who ate the food involving several preparations developed many of the classical symptoms some within 30 minutes. So, here even though direct evidence was not confirmed because one patient's vomit sample contains Staphylococcus aureus coagulase positive and the leftover meat which was there which was present from the area where dinner was held had the same Staphylococcus aureus. From the symptoms and the indirect evidence the outbreak was concluded to be an incidence of the Staphylococcal food poisoning caused by a person who had the acne form rash. The second type of food poisoning we are going to talk about is bacillus serious gastroenteritis. Food poisoning caused by bacillus aureus is an acute intoxication that occurs when this microorganism produces toxins causing two types of gastrostenitis anemetic syndrome or a diarrheal syndrome. Now, here two types the causative organism is bacillus aureus, but depending upon which type of enterotoxin it produces the disease can manifest in two ways one with emitting that is vomiting that is caused by one type of enterotoxin the other produces a diarrheal syndrome that, pro that is produced by a different set of enterotoxins. So, even though the causative organism is still bacillus aureus based on which is the type of enterotoxin secreted the, the type of symptoms exhibited would vary. This can be caused either by ingesting large numbers of bacterial cells or spores in contaminated food this is normally by the diarrheal type or by ingesting the food contaminated with the preformed toxin. So, bacillus cereus is a gram positive spore former which means that even if the organism is not present if the dormant is present in the food and if you happen to consume it and if the conditions are conducive the spore does not get destroyed unless processes are that advanced in a tough condition to kill the spores. If the food is held at conducive atmospheres before you eat then also the bacterium the spore can germinate giving rest to the live bacterium. So, diarrheal type of disease manifestation or emetic type of disease manifestation can be caused. As I said it is a gram positive rod shaped facultatively anaerobic motile beta hemolytic spore forming bacterium this organism bacillus cereus is a commonly found in both soil and food. The emetic type of food poisoning has been largely associated 
with the consumption of rice and pasta, while the diarrheal type is transmitted mostly by milk products, vegetable and meat. The basilisk cereus competes with the other microorganisms like salmonella and campylobacter in the gut. Its presence will reduce the number of these microorganisms. So, suppose the food has been contaminated with different type of microorganisms. For example, it had bacillus cereus, campylobacter and salmonella. Cereus will grow, outgrow these two. And if cereus is present, uh, the, these microorganisms will get reduced. But you will fall sick with cereus poisoning. The diarrheic symptoms observed in patients are thought to stem from three toxins. So, the symptoms of the diarrhea are caused by three toxins which are called as hemolysin BL, non-hemolytic enterotoxin and cytotoxin K. Three types, three types of toxins, hemolysin BL, non-hemolytic enterotoxin and cytotoxin K. The genes for forming these proteins are located on the chromosome of the bacteria and the transcription of these genes is controlled by another gene called as the PLCR. And similar genes are also present in other species of bacillus like thuringiensis and anthracis. These enterotoxins are all produced in the small intestine of the host. So, it will not be digested by the endogenous enzymes. The enterotoxin is produced in the small intestine of the host. They will not get destroyed by the host endogenous enzymes and the HBL and the NHE toxins are pore forming toxins. So, they form a pore. These proteins exhibit a conformation called as the beta barrel that can insert into the cellular membrane due to the hydrophobic exterior thus creating pores with hydrophilic interiors. So, these pore former proteins because of their basic structure can go and form an integral membrane protein get inserted onto the plasma membrane. So, the normal the host plasma membrane now has a pore forming protein a beta barrel structure which is secreted by the bacterium. This insertion in turn is the loss of the cell membrane's potential eventually causing cell death. The C CYTK is a pore forming protein more related to other hemolysins. The emetic syndrome is caused by a toxin called the cerulite. This cerulite the gene for the cerulite and the formation of the protein is found only in the emetic strains and this cerulite is a cyclic polypeptide containing three repeats of four amino acids deoxyleucine, dialanine, uh, eloxyvalin and L-valin and it is believed to bind to a particular receptor called 5-hydroxyltryptamine HT3 serotonin receptors activating them leading to increased vagus nerve stimulation. This cyclic polypeptide with repeat chains actually goes and binds to a specific receptor. Binding of this polypeptide to the receptor in turn causes a change in the configuration in the structure of the receptor which will stimulate the vagus nerve in turn asking the host to produce the symptoms of the disease concerned. Bacillus cereus is also known to cause difficult to eradicate chronic skin infections. This is a side part. This is not related to the food poisoning, but this is also normally seen. The syndrome is rather mild with symptoms developing within 8 to 16 hours, more commonly between 12 to 13 hours and lasting for 6 to 12 hours. This emetic syndromes consist of nausea, cramp like abdominal pains and watery stools, fever is generally absent. In an outbreak of bacillus serious food poisoning, the implicated food will contain large numbers which is greater than 10 to the power of 5 per gram of microorganisms. So, to identify you do not require enrichment techniques and bacillus serious can be identified after 24 hours of incubation at 37 degrees centigrade. The identification factors are the typical colonial morphology, flat or slightly raised colonies, gray gray colonies are seen with a characteristic granular or ground loss texture and the surrounding area would exhibit either alpha or beta hemolysis. So, the manifestation of these in a plate can make a microbiologist say that the organism is bacillus serious. So, this picture actually shows alpha and beta hemolysis. This is not caused by bacillus cereus, but by streptococci. Uh, we see here what happens is that blood agar is a diff in a specific agar. The organisms which can secrete hemolysins which can break down the heme part of the blood are very less. So, if a green color hemolysis is seen it means that the red cell hemoglobin is partially 
oxidized. This is caused by the hydrogen peroxide produced by the bacterium oxidizing hemoglobin to methamo green colored methemoglobin. So, the such hemolysis we call as the alpha hemolysis. In the case of a beta or in the complete hemolysis, all the hemoglobin gets completely broken down and the area appears as light colonies, yellow and transparent colonies where because the hemoglobin is completely broken down. So, identification of organisms is also possible as we saw earlier by detecting the hemolysis pattern alpha, beta or gamma. So, bacillus cereus can be identified can also the strain can be identified by looking at the typical uh, hemolytic pattern whether it is exhibiting alpha hemolysis or whether it is exhibiting beta hemolysis. To confirm the identity on the blood agar isolate or to isolate in a smaller numbers we require more selective diagnostic agar and each organism has a specific selective agar in which only it will grow thereby we can confirm the existence. Four bacillus series polymexin, pyruvate, egg yolk, mannitol, bromothymol blue agar otherwise called as PEMBA is a widely associated example and here polymexin is a selective agent and because of this yeast and the mold would be excluded and on PEMBA bacillus series produces colonies which retain the turquoise blue of the pH indicator and pyruvate in the medium improves the egg yolk precipitation. So, this is how in on a PEMBA the colonies would look like. So, this colony colored structure with the intracellular lipid stain confirms that a causative organism is bacillus cereus. So, in this session we saw how to identify the organisms causing specific types of food poisoning, what are the evidence you look for, what are the confirmatory tests which can be done to identify not only the organism but also to confirm the food source. So, the two questions which I put forth are how do you identify the pathogen associated with a food borne illness and how do you associate a particular food with food poisoning. Thank you.